Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner, and it's great to have you all with us. We are really living in a strange time politically in our country. The deep divide in America has reared its beastly head. We seem to be at each other's throats. Kansans said no to banning abortions, but said yes to Donald Trump. Congresswoman Ilhan Omer barely kept hold of her congressional seat, challenged by a law and order Democrat. And it looks as if the wild west of Wyoming is about to run January the 6th committee star Liz Cheney right out of Dodge. And House Minority Leader McCarthy threatens all-out war if the Republicans succeed in capturing the House of Representatives. The right seems to be surging, controlling much of the body politic. And one man who follows this and writes about it with an astute eye and a positive outlook in the midst of a serious analysis is Nation Magazine's national affairs correspondent, John Nichols. Besides being a friend and a colleague, he's written enough books to fill a small library. His latest is Coronavirus Criminals and Pandemic Profiteers, Accountability for Those Who Caused the Crisis Among Us. And he wrote The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, The Enduring Legacy of Henry Wallace's Anti-Fascist, Anti-Racist Politics, and Horseman of the Trumpocalypse, A Field Guide to the Most Dangerous People in America. And with Robert Mcchesney, People Get Ready, The Fight Against the Jobless Economy, and a citizens-less democracy. And John Nichols, welcome back. Always good to have you with us. It's a great honor to be with you, Mark. Always, always good to see you. Always good to talk to you. So where do you even begin? It just, it, it seems that, I said this the other night in a meeting, that, that a conversation I had, that we seem to be in an America that is in a greater state of flux than I remember it in my lifetime that we may have grown up in ourselves, in, in our generation and generations around us in an anomalous period in this country. And with, with kind of the conservative and, and, and right-wing forces kind of on the verge of seizing power. So talk a bit about where you think we are and why. Well, that's a very good way to set it up, Mark. And I, I think that uh, you have such a, a long perspective and a, and a good perspective that you understand that we've seen tough times before. This is certainly not the first moment in which uh, our country has been deeply divided. We have been more divided than we are at this point. Uh, and, and certainly that was true before the Civil War. Uh, I think it was unquestionably true in the run up to and during the years around World War I, which is sort of an, an underexplored period in our history. Uh, where we saw a real rise of authoritarianism, especially in the aftermath of the war. Um, and, and I think, you know, during the Great Depression, I mean, certainly this country uh, was struggling uh, at a level that at one point Franklin Roosevelt uh, felt compelled to say of the bankers in the country, I welcome their hatred. So we know that, that divisions have been deep and, and that times have been tough. What's different now, and it is distinct, is that we have so much awareness of what's going on on the other side, if you will, that we're far more conscious of uh, the developments as regards the extreme right in America than we were in the past. In the past, uh, people could be taken by surprise, right? Something could come unexpectedly. Now we see it coming. And that's quite a remarkable thing because it allows us to put all of our historical perspective in place uh, as well as deal with the current moment. Uh, and that's, you know, obviously knowledge is supposed to be power, but at the same time, it can be overwhelming because we know that the signs we are seeing are not good, that they lead to things that are incredibly dangerous and destructive. And yet we don't see the evidence that our leaders or frankly, you know, our body politic is necessarily responding in a way that will avert the crisis. Uh, so let's, from there, burrow into the specifics and say that without a question, look, um, we live at a point where Donald Trump is the dominant figure in our politics. He has been the dominant figure in our politics since June of 2015. That is a seven-year period. Uh, frankly, in American history, it's very rare for somebody to be the dominant figure in politics for that long. Uh, and whether he wins or loses, whether he's up, whether he's down, it's always about Trump, right? It all comes back to him. And, um, and you know, what has he brought us? He's brought us uh, an incredibly divisive presidency, of course, the takeover and restructuring of a major political party to the extent that many of its longtime members no longer recognize it, a coup attempt 
that, uh, while unsuccessful, left people dead and, and certainly destabilized the process of transferring power in uh, after the 2020 election. And then a, a, a denial of reality since that coup attempt that uh, exists up to this day and has so taken over the Republican Party that uh, now people who buy into a big lie, an absolute fantasy about democracy, are winning nominations for governorships, for Senate seats, for congressional seats across the country, and are also positioning to take over uh, oversight of elections going into the future. All that going on one track, then we have the other reality that Trump isn't in power, that the Democrats are are in, in charge of the uh, White House and the Congress. And there is an investigation into Trump. There are many investigations into Trump. And we've seen that get to a level of something we've never seen before in American history, a search warrant being executed at the compound of a former, immediate former president of the United States, a potential uh, candidate in the next presidential election. Uh, and then the response of the Republican Party to that, which is perhaps the most historic, you know, from a historic standpoint, the most dramatic thing since the coup attempt on January 6th, uh, 2021. And that is the leading contender to become Speaker of the House if Republicans take control of the House of Representatives, saying that should they come to power, they will use that power to obstruct justice to prevent accountability for Donald Trump and to, in a fully lawless manner, seek to intimidate the Department of Justice and law enforcement agencies uh, to prevent you know, what, what we were taught as school children was a basic premise of the American experiment, and that is that no one is above the law. Uh, so this is, we're in a very perilous moment. And, uh, and while you notice that I am often optimistic, I have to <laughs> warn that this is a time where where optimism is strained. Yeah, no, no, I understand. And I I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I want to ask a little bit of a question about Trump and and, and the last 50 years. So mm -hmm. uh, you and some, not, not completely, but put some of this at the doorstep of Donald Trump, where a lot of it belongs. At the same time, you know, when you look at our history over the last 50 years, in response to the civil rights movement, in response to labor, in response to the anti-war movement, the women's movement, the changes that took place in this country, the Voting Rights Act, all those things that kind of really transformed America. Um, and, when, and at the same time, there was a man named Justice Lewis Powell before he became justice, who yeah. began galvanizing others in this country and be part of a movement to kind of bring conservatives together to say, no, we got to stop this. We have to organize and, and end it. And they have actually on the the larger spectrum of the larger spectrum of the right have really organized a movement and seem highly organized and highly funded and it's been a 50 year march to me Donald Trump is like he he was there he he was a convenient figure he was a convenient buffoon to kind of lead their charge for them but this is a highly organized movement um and yeah. and and also well armed I, I might add um and now controls at least 26 state governments and legislatures. So I mean, it's a, I mean, it, it's, it seems to me that to me is even more dangerous than Trump himself. If, if no matter who takes over after him, DeSantis or anybody else. Well, you're exactly right. There's always look. This is that's the important perspective to have. Um, nobody is uh, uh, a dominant figure in and of themselves, right? They always are a product of their times and a product of uh, the developments that came before them. And in the case of Donald Trump. Uh, he is the latest in a long series of individuals who were put into positions of power by the Republican Party because they thought they could win elections. Right. Um, you know, Mitch McConnell knows full well that he could never win a presidential election. I mean, he, it would be an absurd construct. Right. He's a very unappealing <laughs> figure. Um, and most of the people who Mitch McConnell turns to for money, uh, they couldn't win an election for dog catcher in their own hometown. Right. <laughs> These are literally rich people who want to lower their own taxes by redis and redistribute wealth upwards so that they take money from the poor. I mean, they make, they're they like characters who stepped out of a Robin Hood story, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the bad characters, worse than the sheriff of Nottingham. And so they couldn't win elections. So they're always looking for somebody that they can put forward. 
And I mean, the classic uh, step and frank, frankly, a genius move was uh, they went to Hollywood, right? They, they found an actor, Ronald Reagan, to be their, their front man uh, for many of their economic and, and foreign policy initiatives in the 1980s. And then uh, after they lost the presidency for a period, they turned to you know the son of a former president, George W. Bush, um, who was so dim-witted that he you know he was quizzed and you know couldn't name you officials in Canada, right? I mean, this is this guy is a relatively incompetent figure, but um, he had this concept of compassionate conservatism and came off as you know relatively likable, a guy you quote unquote could have a beer with, and they they rolled the dice on Bush for a while, thinking that they could hold him up by having Cheney, you know, pulling the strings in the background. And, you know, that came a cropper because Bush led us into an illegal and immoral war and then crashed the global economy. I mean, by the way, it is important to understand that many of these people are, in fact, incompetent. Um, And so then, you know, you got into a situation in 2016 where Republicans were desperate to retake the presidency. And the last person they wanted was Donald Trump. I mean, it wasn't they weren't seeking Donald Trump, but because their, you know, quote unquote, best and brightest were such it was such a clown car full of candidates. Trump was able to shove them aside and become the nominee of the party. And then here's where the interesting thing came in, because Trump wasn't their choice. Right. He wasn't the person they wanted there. So they had to figure out, well, are we going to, you know, wrap our heads around this? Are we going to embrace this? Is this going to be who we are? And. Uh, instead of taking a temporary loss and saying, OK, let's let let's not work very hard for Trump. Let's let him lose because we don't want him to be president. They were so desperate for power that Liz Cheney and, and all these other people united behind Trump in 2016. And by the way, 2020 um, got him across the line in 2016. He lost the popular vote, but still because of our totally uh, unfair and dysfunctional uh, electoral college system, became president of the United States, uh, was a disastrous president. It led us into a crisis with the coronavirus pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. Again, an incompetent put in there because uh, the people who run the Republican Party thought he could win. Uh, and then there's an interesting thing, Mark. They lost control. The, the, the power brokers lost control over the monster they had created, right? And so uh, now they're dealing with a complex reality of a guy who faces multiple criminal investigations, a character who led a coup attempt, uh, a, a, you know, a racist, a xenophobe, somebody who is incredibly destructive and dangerous, and they can't keep him away from the game, right? He's constantly making endorsements. He's constantly campaigning. He is preparing to run again for president in 2024, and they can't stop him. So rather than say, boy, we've created something so dangerous uh, and we can't stop them within our own party. So we're pulling back. We're just not going to, we're not going to destroy the country in this regard. They have said, nope, we'll, you know, we'll wrap our heads around this. We'll, we'll embrace this. And, and this is the fundamental reality. Kevin McCarthy knows that Donald Trump shouldn't be president of the United States. Kevin McCarthy has even said in the past, you know, that he doesn't think, you know, Trump is a particularly competent figure that uh, he he is frightened by Trump on a variety of levels. This comes out all the time from McCarthy and, you know, like tapes of statements and things like that. And yet here he is saying that he will use the full power of Congress to defend Donald Trump. And he's not alone. And Lindsey Graham, who is actually a very smart member of the United States Senate, uh, was out, you know, urging Trump to announce quicker for the presidency in 2024. So we are on a collision course now with what the Republican Party has become. And that makes the 2022 and 2024 elections uh, incredibly important elections. I know we always say that this is the most important right. election of our lifetime. Right. That's, a, that's a stupid thing right. to say. Right. Right. Every, the most important elections are usually the ones that you don't even notice till afterwards. <laughs> right? 2016 was an important election, right? I mean, Trump should have been stopped there. He wasn't. There you go. 1968 was an important election. You know, Nixon should have been stopped. He wasn't. There you go. You know what I mean? We Sometimes you. it's only when you look back on it that you realize the importance of them. But what we should understand is that the 2022 and 2024 elections are a critical juncture in American history, whether we call them important or whatever word we want to use. This is the point where we will decide whether a 
European style white nationalist extremist politics that owes more to Viktor Orban than to Dave or than to Abraham Lincoln or Dwight Eisenhower uh, becomes a part of American politics and is in fact the dominant reality of one of our major parties. And in that context, we will also determine how the other party, because we're locked into a, a two party system, which is often dysfunctional, but we will see how the other party responds to that threat. And I, I tell you, Mark, you know history and, and, and are, are well aware of international history. We're not the first country that's come to this place, right? Um, but I can tell you that, that how we resolve this, how we deal with this as a country, uh, will determine everything about what this country is, you know, for certainly the next 20, 25 years. So, so I, I'm sorry. Hugely, incredibly important political time. It's always going to be. How do you see this in terms of the dy- the political dynamic in this country where you see both a Republican Party that is deeply divided but controlled more and more by essentially right-wing elements? You may We may see Liz Cheney in the next day or so um, – lose her election. It seems very possible she will lose in Wyoming. Um, I think it's likely. Yeah, I think it's very likely. And and and, uh, and as you wrote, you wrote an eloquent piece about her and all the contradictions that she represents <laughs> as Liz Cheney, who's now become a, 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 hero, a hero to some. Um, and then in the Democrats are all sweetly divided. You saw the Ilhan Omar uh, race uh, where um, she, she was barely won uh, against a Democrat who was a, a kind of a very conservative law and order Democrat. And and also the kind of, there's this, there's this neoliberal progressive divide inside the Democratic Party. So there seems to be, the, the, the political dynamic is is really intense with with, with 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 no real unity anywhere. So how do you see that playing out? How do you see, I mean, oh. We've seen progressives lose in these primaries as well, like Levin and others. Yeah, I mean, some progressives have lost, some have won. This has been a very complex. Yes, yeah, right, right, uh, right. Season. You know, Greg Kassar down in uh, Texas won a very important primary early on. Uh, Summer Lee in, in Pennsylvania right. uh, won a very important primary. So you can, you know, you kind of look across the map. You're going to see signals going best in both directions. Two of the U.S. Senate candidates who are probably the most important Senate candidates for the Democrats in 2022 are both progressives, Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin and John Fetterman in Pennsylvania. And and so the progressive movement continues to be an incredibly important force within the Democratic Party. It is the dynamic force within the Democratic Party. Unfortunately, the Democratic elites and the establishment doesn't like it. They don't like the progressives. They, they, they would prefer uh, to have a political party that is cautious and centrist and that doesn't get much done and which is why they, they're lo- right which is why they're being right. why, they, losing. why they lose right and it satisfies the donor class uh rather than uh the working class and it is a real crisis at this point mark because um the they're so satisfied with doing so little that um they went into default for about a year uh after the build back better plan uh kind of collapsed last year because of Joe Manchin. Um, they, mm-hmm. they just they didn't get anything done. And then only in the last week or so, they're, in a couple of weeks, they're like, oh my gosh, we're about to go into a midterm election with you know, virtually no accomplishments in a year, right? When you control the presidency in the House and the Senate. And suddenly they, they you know, like flip the switch and are like, oh, we better do some things, right? And the incredible thing is, what do they do when they realize they've got to get something done? <laughs> they put a whole bunch of money into climate, right? Addressing the climate crisis, which is a really good idea, and a whole bunch of money into healthcare and even taking on, you know, to some minimal extent, the drug companies. So they, when they're in trouble, they do progressive things because <laughs> it's the only way out of that trouble. And yet on a, any given day, if the establishment of the Democratic Party has its way, they will defeat progressives in primaries. They will push them to the side. They will marginalize them. They will silence them and not listen to them. They will, you know, do everything they can to undermine them. And so you have a deeply, deeply dysfunctional Democratic Party. It's a party that that doesn't want its strongest element to uh, be able to be heard, to be able to be effective. Um, and you know what it tells us, Mark, at the most basic level is that. Uh, 
it is our electoral system that determines that we have two parties, right? We have we have kind of set up a structure, both formal and informal in this country, that that basically imposes the reality of two political parties. If we had a different system like France, uh, I think the Democratic and the Republican parties would probably both uh, have been completely marginalized by this point. They wouldn't. They would be pushed to the side. There would be new parties. There would be a, a party of the left built around Bernie Sanders and people allied with him. There would be a Trump-like party of white nationalism and ex- extremism. There would be uh, a center-right party and probably a center-left party. Right? You know, you'd have you'd have a mix. And if we had coalition uh, governance, you might even have another party or so. And 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 people would move between them, and, and electoral power would move between them. We don't have that in America. We have failed in the post-World War II era to do the electoral reforms that virtually every other country did. And as a result, we end up with a system that locks us into a choice between one party that is now spiraling toward authoritarianism and you know, extreme white nationalism of a, of a very, I think, frightening and troublesome form. And then we have another party that is often... Uh, dysfunctional in responding to that crisis and in you know filling the void of, of popular sentiment and popular will and and so uh, we you and I and and the brilliant people that listen to your show um, are you know kind of stuck here watching uh, something like I, and I know many folks are urban uh, I grew up in, in a small town and so mm-hmm. uh, we had county fairs and at the county fair on Sunday night the big entertainment was the demolition derby <laughs> right. And you watch the cars crash into each other. Right. And uh, to an extent, we are watching a political demolition derby and, and hoping uh, that, you know, a particular <laughs> particular driver comes out of it, you know, and, and gets the, the trophy at the end. But it's not a very it, it, it isn't something that uh, rises to the level of, uh, you know, highest stage democracy. This is a real mess. And uh, with that said. With all that said, um, I think that that we have to take it very seriously, and we ultimately have to figure out um, how we can, frankly, quite pragmatically and quite practically, get out of the first stage crisis, which is the threat to democracy itself. I mean, how do we make sure that we maintain democracy and then quickly move into the crises that extend beyond that? So the final question here, let's... And, 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 um... You can go run off and catch a plane, whatever you're doing at the moment. I'm, I'm at your service, Mark. I, want, I love, I love, talk, no, I want to emphasize you being very polite and, and, and it is crazy schedules, but I love talking to you and I am delighted to answer your questions. I'm, and I appreciate that. Your I, appreciate, I, I really want to emphasize that. I appreciate that. So, I, so clearly we're not going to become a political, we're not, we're not a parliamentary democracy. And I wonder in terms of the, you've, you've written a lot over the last month or two. Um, and uh, talking about a, a, a lot of this that we face. And so I, I, I'm really curious how you see this playing out politically in the United States. When you see this huge divide here in the United States that we have, when you, when you see that, that instead of a parliamentary system, we have this, these deeply divided two parties that are both really deeply divided. Um, and, uh, and, and how this ends up playing out in terms of I got to put this, bringing John Nichols kind of uh, uh, Midwestern optimism, left politics that is that is born of Debs and LaFollette and more. What do you say about what that teaches about where we could be going and how we get there? Well, I mean, I mean, in a, sure. you know, I'm, yeah, I'm just curious where you think this takes us. Well, I will. Uh, I, I love the question. Um and I think the answer is that uh, we come through, we survive. I operate on the basis of hope, not hopelessness. Um, you know, cynicism and, and a, a sense that it can't work out, that's, that's the easy out, right? Because you say, you know, well, there's really no hope. And then when things turn out badly, you say, see, I knew it was coming, right? And if things turn out well, nobody remembers your hopelessness, right? Uh, it's much better and much more challenging to, to believe in the possibility. And then, um, then you start to get into the data, right? Uh, because you don't just 
hope is not optimism. It's a big difference. Rebecca Solnit always makes this mm-hmm. point that optimism is saying, oh, yeah, everything's going to work out fine, right? Hope is a desire that things work out fine, but not a certainty that, that they will. And so as a result, um, you know, what we're really talking about here is a, a, a political circumstance in which um, you have to believe that, that things can, can go the right way. And you ask, well, why wouldn't they go the right way? Well, the answer is not that the American people are on the wrong side of these issues. This is an important thing to understand. Polling shows us that the American people don't want authoritarian, authoritarianism. They don't want totalitarianism. They want a Medicare for all type system. They understand the need for a Green New Deal. Uh, they, they frankly know that Trump is a horrible player. And in fact, remember, Trump has never gotten anywhere near a majority of the vote for president right. of the United States. Um, you know, so on balance, you know, there's a lot of things that, that, that are on the side of, of light, if you will. And intriguingly enough, um, you have a, a situation where on one of the issues that's come into play, the issue of a uh, woman's right to choose and the right to choose, um, where, uh, you know, we've got polling that shows, you know, some huge majorities of Americans uh, believe in reproductive freedom, right? And, and so as a result, when you put all this together, right, um, we, progressives should be winning. The left should be winning. Um, and so it is only the incompetence of the leaders of the Democratic Party uh, that, that makes this, this not a win in combination with a very unfair and dysfunctional system. So um, can it turn out OK? Absolutely. It could turn out great. Um, will it? Uh, that really falls, I think, to, the, to, to us, to the great mass of people to um, rise up and say it's got to be better than this. And uh, I, my sense is that uh, what we have to do is put aside punditry, right? Because as you know, Mark, everyone has become a pundit, right? Everyone talks about polls and everyone talks about what's possible and what isn't possible. Put it aside, right? And instead of talking about punditry, talk about what's necessary, what mm-hmm. we need to do. And that's a big difference, right? Uh, because instead of saying what you can't do, it's what needs to happen. And the fact of the matter is we need to defeat Trump and Trumpism, right? This needs to be dealt with uh, in a political context. And that can happen. It happened in 2018. It happened in 2020. We're on a, we're on a streak here. Can it happen in 2022? Well, to do that, you have to undo uh, the patterns of midterm elections, where in a midterm the party that is out of power generally does better. Um, if that happens because of the narrow divides in the House and the Senate and in the states, uh, then Trumpism is on the march and it, it comes back, you know, in a major way, not just in the Republican Party but in our politics in general. If it doesn't happen, then we turn the corner in the right direction. And so here's where it gets really interesting, and and that is, can we have an election in which the issues are made so crystal clear? that people cast the vote that they have to vote, the necessary vote, uh, even if that causes them to go out of their comfort zone a little bit, uh, if you're like a suburban uh, you know, Republican or a suburban independent or something like that. Mm-hmm. Can that happen? It absolutely can. It did happen in 2018 and in 2020. It has to happen again this time. And so I don't want to reduce everything to electoral politics because I think there's much, much more than electoral politics. Yeah, absolutely. But what I will, te- what I will tell you is, in this circumstance, this is where it's in a sense, it's the easy way out. Beat these guys, beat them, beat them in a strong and powerful way. Um, the last time that happened was 1934. And it was under Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt knew that to take on the challenges, of the Great Depression and the rise of fascism in Europe uh, and the threat that it posed even to the United States, that Franklin Roosevelt had to get a bigger victory in 1934 than he had gotten in 1932. He went out, traveled the country, and he won it. He didn't win it by going to the right or going to the center or pulling punches. He went to the left right. very bluntly, and, and he spelled out the threat. He talked at every turn about the threat of authoritarianism, about the threat of economic imperialism uh, at home and abroad, and it yielded a victory that was epic, right? And that's why we got the New Deal. We didn't get the New Deal because of 1932. We got the New Deal because of 1934. And similarly, um, we're not going to get any of the benefits of the 2020 election 
because of 2020. We will get them if we're lucky because of 2022. And this is that's how important this election is. That's how necessary it is. And if the Democrats fail us in, in delivering that message, uh, then we're in dire straits. Uh, if they deliver the message, then the possibility is that we could take make the pivot at this critical moment and actually get ourselves as a country moving in the direction that we have to move. You, you said it succinctly, and I think of it as at the 1870s, 1930s, the 2020s. There are many connections between those eras and what we face, and it can go either way. John Nichols, I, I always appreciate the time you take to, to talk with us and with me, and I look forward to many more conversations and what you write next. Well, I'll be writing a lot, and I will tell you <laughs> that, uh, that I'll remind you in, a, in the last moment of uh, Tony Benn, the great British parliamentarian, who said in the 1930s that uh, as a young man, they would look around the world and pick up a headline every day and ask, which way did this country go or which way did that country go? Um, I think that we're really at a similar time today, different politics. And I don't I'm, I'm not naive or, or even, you know, apocalyptic. I'm right. just saying that, you know, I just would like to pick up the paper in November and see that the United States went the right way. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with John Nichols. We'll link to his works here on our website. And if you have an extra minute, please go to www.therealnews.com and become a monthly donor. Support the future with us. Only you can do it. And once again, thank you all for joining us today. And please let me know what you thought about what you heard today, what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com and I'll write you right back. So for Stephen Frank, Dwayne Gladden, Kayla Rivera, and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care.